So actually, I, I wanted to introduce him with this CV, with resume, but I, we have only 40 minutes. So actually, I cannot go through all of your CV. So I'm going to read a part of it. Uh, professor uh, Siram Ramakrishna is a professor of mechanical engineering, co-director of NUS Nanoscience and Nanotechnology Initiatives, head of the science for nanofiber and nanotechnology, also chair of the Circular Economy Task Force. Professor Siram Everest Chair is among the top four leading scientists of Singapore. He is an elected fellow of UK Royal Academy of Engineering, Singapore Academy of Engineering, Indian National Academy of Engineering, and ASEAN Academy of Engineering. He is also an elected fellow of American Associations for the Advancement of Science. He received PhD of Cambridge University, among numerous recognitions. He received Honorary Everest Chair of Nepal, Honorary Engineering Doctorate, Central University of Technology, South Africa. He has been among the world's most influential scientific minds. He is on the top one person highly cited researchers in the world in material science and cross-field categories. Microsoft Academy ranked him among the top, five, the top 25 authors out of 3 million materials researchers worldwide, listed among the top three scientists of the world in biomedical engineering, has per a study base on a career-long impact of research or CD score. His academic leadership includes NUS Vice President, Dean of Faculty of Engineering, Directors of NUS Enterprise, Directors of NUS Industry License Office, Directors of NUS International Relations Peace Office, Founder of NUS Bioengineering, and he served as a board member of several organization, policies, institute, and tertiary education institution. He is a member of UNESCO Global Independent Expert Group on University on the 2030 Agenda. He is also an author of the book, The Changing Face of Innovation. Thank you very much, Prof. Serum, to be with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, can you hear me? Oh, very good. Thank you, Professor. I think that's the point. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I think this is probably better, right? Oh, very good. Well, let me begin by saying uh, thanks to Professor Zavi. About 10 days ago, he called me and said, we have this I Imagination Week. And we had a common colleague. Her name is Stella. She's working for you. And they said, Professor, it might be interesting if you can come and share your mind with our young minds. I said, yeah, that seems like a challenge for me. Before I say anything, the topic is Ways of Life 2050. I want to ask a small question to you, and I'll give you three multiple choice. You decide which one you pick. The question, is my lecture going to be fun, boring, or I don't know? So, fun. Well, we got 20%. Boring. You can say it, it's OK. <laughs> well, you're all polite. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, that's good. So that comes, like we have 50-50 almost. Why I ask this question is, when Xavier said, give a talk, and a chosen topic is ways of life, 2050, actually more or less, I would, my answer would be the same as your answer about my lecture. You don't know about me. Just happened to meet me now, just five minutes ago. And you need to think how I would present, whether I would be engaging, interesting. Now, imagining about 2050 and the life would be even more challenging. So here is an illustration what I intend to say is whatever I'm going to say, Take it as a 50-50, right? We just prove that. 
Okay, so as I was introduced, I work at the National University of Singapore, and I was uh, very much ignited by the topic that was given to me, uh, Ways of Life 2050. So I began thinking about it the last 10 years, sorry, the last 10 days. I put together these slides and I said, I said 10 years, right? It's okay, I'll take that way. Well, I think I've been thinking about it more than 10 years, I think. If I imagine your age, you would be somewhere 25 plus and minus, right? And if I add 30 years to you, which would be my age, and in a way, you are, I'm looking at you backwards. Because this is about future. If you go forward for the next 30 years, you will reach my point in my life, chronologically, right? So let's see. Well, my views about the future, and hopefully how much of that will become true as you walk through your life and your career, your profession, and you reach my stage, and then probably you could have a laugh at it. Here, I intentionally chose slides in a way they are provocative, meaningful, at the same time, ambiguous. Zawiya told me clearly, I would introduce you, but I also want you to self-introduce myself. So then I said, my resume can be checked on the internet. It's obvious, easy to find. But there's things which probably you won't self-describe. When you have an opportunity like this, and when someone says, I wrote a book which combines philosophy and spirituality and innovation. By the way, he just gave me the book. And I said, that's really very much resonates with what I normally think with my mind and my brain. So I said, let me actually explain myself differently. For the sake of this, uh, this uh, presentation today, I like to describe myself as a kum with a lens. Kum is basically has teeth. You can plow into different disciplinary topics deeply. And also it has a horizontal part, you integrate them. Zoom lens, what I mean is, I could get down to the minute details and zoom out to a big picture or a helicopter view. So I, had, I seem to have that ability to zoom in and zoom out and integrate or connect the dots. So this is how I describe myself. At the end of uh, today's presentation, you can tell me, Professor, you're totally wrong. You think too much about yourself. That's fine. Okay, so I have education and experience in the five or six continents. I'm expert on cross-fields research. It's uh, well uh, recognized worldwide by Thomson Reuters, Clarivate Analytics. I seem to have a lot of interest in science because I'm an engineer by training, but I also have a, a deeper sense of life, spirituality, and philosophy. That's exactly why my first conversation with Xavier really made me to uh, take more deeper interest about this lecture. And uh, there is other side of me which normally people don't know is I often have a deep conversations, very transparent, with lots of people around the world of all ages, all ethnicities, all backgrounds. Fortunately, I could be on the internet or meet the person in the plane. Within 10 minutes, we would end up talking very, very deeply and totally transparent. And probably that conversation that person ever, ever had that he or she in her life or his life, it's fantastic. So I seems to be able to do that, and I think uh, uh, part of that really shaped my mind. So I fundamentally believe what humans know is the limit, and relently, relentlessly pursuing or pushing this limit is the most interesting, fun part of actually human beings or the progress. That's what I actually subscribe to. Now, after 20 or 35 minutes of my speech, finally a conclusion would be like this. So I start with the conclusion, 
and then I'll take you through why I say those things. So I believe ways of life, 2050, you have, if I have to describe in maybe two or three bullet points, first one, I would like to put my weight on this one is sustainability or low carbon economy will be used as a lens in all actions of human life. And we would reimagine products and services. That's what is going to happen. They would lead to new jobs, economic growth, and new opportunities. You doing BBA, your uh, management programs, I'm sure eventually you will be change makers, leaders in making this happen. I also believe science and technologies mimicking the human mind will underpin the future products and services. I say mimicking human mind because right now we understand very little in a mechanistic way the human mind. But going forward, there's a huge advances are happening which would enable us to understand human mind much more deeply. Mimic it, we can make products and services. And I could give you several examples related to that. It's already happening. I believe I, as a futurist or able to say something about the future, I would say there is a probability you can redesign and augment your own mind. So I believe that's possible after in the next 30 years, probably later, but it's going to happen. So now I'm going to drill down to those main points and saying why I say those points. Here is a worldwide map where different countries, their pledges towards carbon neutral are sustainability. And you see many countries have pledged and they're somewhere between 2050 and 2060. And most of these pledges actually started at the Paris Agreement a few years ago. Well, you're all French, right? I was told 90% of you are French here, right? Yes or no? No? Okay. I was told when, when I came here. Anyway, it's good. That is a historical moment, uh, the Paris Agreement, uh, where the many countries agreed that they would work towards sustainability and low carbon economy. And you would see these countries and the numbers, the years, uh, they are targeting. So uh, that's very clear indication, at least there is a pledge and there is probably some push from the business community as well as the public so that the world will transition towards this direction. On the right side, there is a bit of uh, GDP projections that came out about uh, two weeks ago. Uh, that could be subject to the world, how it evolves, but more or less what they're saying is Asia will have a bigger role and that's why you are here to experience it. And I'm sure uh, there would be more interactions between Europe and Asia. To convince you, I give an example. Apple is a more than $1 trillion company with a market cap, has announced they would be carbon neutral by 2030, which is 10 years away. And Apple would not say unless they know our serious about how to demonstrate they are carbon neutral. So I would actually believe they would do that. And there's al already, they began to do many steps towards this direction. And they just announced Apple will modify executive bonuses based on environmental values. Just they announced uh, two to three weeks ago. So it's a big statement for a major company which has a brand value. Then if you are in Singapore, I do not know how long you've been here, but uh, there's a lot of uh, push towards meat alternatives uh, with the goal of self-sustenance in Singapore, primarily because of COVID-19. Uh, supply chains are disrupted. So that's the reason uh, Singapore want to go towards 30% uh, of the national food and nutrition needs uh, locally made. We are not an agricultural country, but that's the direction we are going. Uh, we're making a huge progress, but that's also involving a lot of innovation 
uh, in this case is a meat alternatives. So, we can go into the details, but the main driver here is we do not sacrifice animals, we leverage the plants, we leverage the advanced technology and science, uh, we meet, we make meat analogs. Uh, they would taste and probably smell very similar to the, the meat harvested from the animals. And such meat are already available like impossible burger is a classical example and there are several others. Now, I go further details, I basically want to say that science and technology and business innovations will be aimed at 100 percent domestic recycling of waste and 100 percent recycling of products. If I look at France and Singapore, if I compare, we just published a paper, France is a, has a target of 100 percent uh, waste recycling. So, uh, that is kind of model I am sure other countries would like to emulate because nowadays shipping solid waste across the national borders is highly limited. For example, this year China said we do not want any solid waste from foreign countries. So, that is a huge shift the way the waste is shifted around the world. So, I go forward I basically say innovations going to happen in the several sectors, food, water, energy, travel, infrastructure, education, communication, entertainment, safety and security. Since the time is limited, I would not go into the detail, but otherwise I can give you examples and illustration in each one of those uh, major topics. And just to convince you that what is already happening, for example, banking and finance, there is a near cashless society emerging at least uh, certain Asian countries as well as other countries. And manufacturing is because of COVID-19, the global supply chains are changing now, uh, what we call insourcing, near sourcing or shorter, closer uh, supply chains, that will happen. Education is clearly a blended learning or I call gig learning. In fact, last one year I did not go to the classroom. Last 12 months is the first time I am coming to the classroom. Last one year I was doing all my modules through online because of COVID-19 we are asked not to go to the class and engage students. So, we had to transfer from my 26 years of experience in classroom teaching to online learning and now students used to this one, they actually prefer to have at least a majority of teaching online. I actually know why they like it. What happens in my experience is I teach them, uh, when I switch on the zoom all the students will sign in. But we are not, uh, we do not need to ask the students switch on the video or audio. So, what happens is I keep delivering my lecture. I assume students are there. Sometimes I intentionally say I finished the lecture, normally lecture duration is 2 hours. I just decide ok, today 45 minutes lecture is finished. You know what 80 percent of my the class is still around even if I say lecture is finished. How do you explain that? <laughs> you know what you know right? Basically they turn it on, they signed in they are probably happily sleeping or something else. Right. I am sure if I am this web, web, webinar I need to attend probably I will turn it on, I do not turn on my audio and video, I would do a lot of other things. Unless the speaker is so interesting and he says something really, really important for me. It is a human behavior. Well, we see that uh, new things are happening. Healthcare definitely going to be more and more personalized and ubiquitous. So, if you recognize me, that is also me, but that was many years ago, I would probably say about uh, 10 years ago, I was uh, basically focusing on healthcare. There was a question asked to me is, tell us as a scientist, how would you say we should lead our life, lifestyle, so that we will have a 100 years or more ability to have a longer lifespan. So, if you are interested you can check the TEDx video 
uh, there's a lot of tips because I interviewed lots of people who are 80, 90, 104, 110 years old people around the world. Just to give that lecture, I took a reason to go around the world to meet the people. So I heard their stories, it was fascinating. So then I came back and gave a TEDx lecture. But we need some reason to travel around the world, right? So that's one of the reasons. Okay, so the summary of that is basically, it made me to understand about myself very, very deeply. Here is an illustration. What happens to every one of us in the next, well, for you, of course, next to maybe 70 years? So between 20 to 100 years, you would see the major changes our body our tissues and organs that go through. What's interesting is there's a difference between male and female. While the medicines are all tested on males, they all need to be retested and their suitability for the females. So pharmaceutical industry requires to revisit this. Similarly, it also depends on genetics, lifestyle, as well as climate. So where these people are living, uh, there is a way the aging process takes place. So very interesting. What's more interesting from that is I understood if you use the term intellectual efficiency, that how, how efficient is my mind or my brain, it's not a scientific one, but it's more an observational way. You could say right now you are at the peak of your intellectual efficiency, all of you. So what's the message here? Don't waste it, right? You are right at the right time. So this is the perfect time for you to leverage your highest potential. So that's basically what it says. If you're still not convinced, that's more scientific. Uh, they define this as a crystallized intelligence, uh, fluid intelligence, and then there is something called a combination of that we call general intelligence. Again. 25 to 30 is where you, you reach the peak. So you know information like this tells you that you are your best period of your life. Should you want to be innovative or taking the risks or should you like to do something, really solve some problem, you are at the right time, the right period of your life and the world. So. Building on that, 2050, I believe because so many changes in the human body as well as what's going on, I believe there would be much more seamless integration of living tissues and organs with engineered systems and digital technologies. So on the right side, you see almost a cyborg kind of picture. That's mostly to make the point. But the main thing is many parts of our body can be replaced. And there are many, many examples are available. So going forward, there would be seamless integration. Uh, for example, what you see on the left side, which some of the technologies we develop, these are wearables. So big companies like Apple, Huawei, and many others now, they actually have products coming up in terms of measuring vital signs from your body 724 hours. And then build it provide that information for healthcare and wellness. So going forward, there would be much more such devices, uh, wearables uh, that would be developed and would be made available. I say a little bit stretched concept, redesign own mind via advances in artificial intelligence, uh, neural interfaces, that's our research, quantum chips, quantum biology, psychedelics, wearables, and augmented brain. So just imagine the science, innovation, advances in these areas. You are able to read the mind, tap the signals from the brain, record the dreams, record the memory, augment them change your neuronal processes in your brain. In other words, change your mind. So I actually believe as we progress, uh, there would be much more 
possibilities this will happen. By the way, what I, what I who ha, I have next to me can anybody guess? Yes, Robo exactly, Sophia. So, Sophia Robo and it is very clever and that is already 5, 6 years ago that photo. So, there is a lot more advances uh, coming in the robot. And then life itself what is COVID-19 uh, told us is in addition to air, water and food, social nourishment interaction are very important across the planet because social distancing and isolation a good proportion of people are having depression, anxiety, mental difficulties or you want to call mental challenges. Again that brings to the point that mind is very important and that requires social interactions. So, uh, below that there is information which is scientific studies they say in a day about six and six thousand thoughts go through your head. Previously they were saying 60,000, but now they are saying 6,000, but some number. What that means is any given minute as you are listening to me, four or five thoughts are running through your head. And if you observe them, 90 percent of them are actually repetitive. You have the same thoughts as yesterday, maybe a few days ago and 80 percent of them probably negative. So, why we make this point important is if you understand thoughts are common in our head, uh, this is the frequency and uh, this is the nature of the thoughts and then on the right side you have that one uh, unstressed condition, a stress condition, your, your ability to control your thoughts, your actions, you now realize well you know you can do a lot of things once you have this understanding. Especially if you are an innovator or a business leader, you would have to do that. So, I go deeper since I have a, a lot of interest in this area. I believe that our thoughts and emotions basically define us, shape us, our way of life, our actions. And if you look around, there is lots of bubbles. I cannot go through each bubble because they are all very important. They actually shape our thoughts and emotions. The main thing I want to make a, an important point here is using your thinking you can modulate your thoughts. So, if you can practice that you have a control, but of course you have to believe us and then after that you actually need to practice it and it is possible. In the future next 30 years you will have access to devices, systems and methods to perceive your own thoughts perhaps augment and redesign your own mind. So, that is uh, what I said in a, a few slides before I given a different uh, technology areas that is contributing to that. So, there is a lots of important uh, variables that would shape or influence thought processes. So, from there I am trying to relate to Professor Zawie, he has written the book and he just he gave me his beautiful book. He is connecting innovation to philosophy and spirituality. In a way this is my own thoughts where we all begin with self progress, self enrichment. Probably we generate lots more happiness if we are part of generating new knowledge, new ideas and we connect dots we feel when we understand things, we are able to do things, we feel much better empowered. Eventually, you end up enabling other people like Tesla, Elon Musk said he is going to donate his 200 billion dollars to do certain things. I think most successful business leaders eventually uh, they would go towards mentoring or enabling others also progress. I think sharing knowledge is probably what I call a circular mind I am also chair of circular economy task force at the National University of Singapore. So, I have been constantly thinking in everything in terms of circular and that is the reason I use the word circular mind. So, we, we all need to transcend from linear mind to a circular mind so that 
we can have an impact which is perennial and expansive. Again back to my conversation with Zavi, he said he liked to see innovation transferred to the others so that they can innovate and then through that you would actually sustain your ideas, your efforts, your thoughts and forever or at least longer period. So, you think she's also a robot? Ah, she's not a robot. Uh, her name is Adriana Marias. I met her two, three years ago in South Africa and she was telling me at the age of seven, she decided she wants to go to the Mars. I was completely surprised but she said to me, I come from that and uh, she's one of the hundred candidates uh, that shortlisted to go to the planet Mars and I asked her, why do you do that? And basically she said, most people do things which are common, routine or maybe more interesting in the general sense. But she said, I want to do something which would be a long lasting impact for the humanity. Her goal is to go there and find evidence of life in the space, evidence of life in the space. So, she says, for her that's the most important motivation and she decided when she was very little, younger. So, you could see this uh, lots of others, uh, very interesting motivations through which I think space travel probably would become more of a reality in the next 30 years or so. So, well you have another picture here, also not a robot, she was my former student, she lives now in UK and uh, she, she is into adventure sports and then she met with some accident. After that she believes what she said is what is written there. Well, I, I train lots of students of course, more than 50 PhD students and several hundreds of postdocs and uh, uh, research experts. Why did I chose this picture? 2012, me, now also you can see me, right? So, I have, a, I have a purpose why I put this picture. Can anybody guess? Professor Zavi has a you know prize if you correct guess it right. <laughs> I know we have a limited time. The reason I put this picture, I also did not know why I put the picture, but I circulated my presentation to my network and one of the comments that came back to me, my network people, looks like you are aging well. So, they basically compared that picture and now and they said, hey you Siram, you are aging well. Then I said, yeah, that's not a bad, bad comment and you remember in the initial 10 slides I was telling you about uh, lots of things that go into shaping our mind, our thoughts, impacts our life as well as everything else, health as well. So, I guess uh, with a deeper knowledge, uh, it certainly would help us age very well. A uh, clear example is me, there is no fake there, that is definitely me uh, 80 years ago. So, here I am right, 2021. No stem cells, nothing, <laughs> it is all normal. Okay, so I think we would not take too much time, basically I would like to say, uh, I also said in the beginning opening slides, I am also deeply into science as well as um, philosophy, spirituality, general life itself. So, my belief is this, we all have a personal responsibility as any living being, I think it is a self responsible because a living being has to be self responsible. Uh, next step is family or social responsibility, then it is about having the freedom, contributing, generating, absorbing knowledge and then sustainability of earth's beings and systems. Again people say that COVID-19, uh, one of the reason is there is excessive urbanization, consumption, disturbance to the natural ecosystem. Uh, that is why these viruses, zoonotic viruses are jumping, uh, jump, jumping from animals to the humans because of uh, disturbance to their systems. And if you go along that line, 
it's all about how we ensure the living mass other than human beings on the planet earth also has a role on planet earth. In other words, sustainability of earth and its beings. And the last one, well I think this is East Asia or Asia. Uh, there's a steep, there's a lot of uh, spiritual ideas here. Uh, one concept out clearly there is unition, you after current life is about unition with expanse of nature. Uh, but that's where Xavier told me in, my, in our conversation, he thinks that uh, spirit, soul or whatever remaining, you could still perpetuate a process of spiritual innovation or philosophical innovation. I'm saying it without reading his book because he just gave me the book. After I read it, probably I would modify my statements. But if I understood what he said, is essentially what he said is, if you can share your mind, your knowledge, your innovative ideas through others, and then they will pick it up and they build it on from there and that will continue so that the humanity will continue to progress. I think that's his uh, core idea, I guess. Okay, in conclusion, sustainability or low carbon economy will be the new normal in 2050. Potentially, we will be able to redesign, augment our own mind. What humans know is the limit and we need to push this limit relentlessly. With that, I just want to say thank you and together let's make this happen, this future, whatever we think is the future that need to shape up. Thank you again. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Siram, for your talk. Um, about one, one thing, um, one question first. As one of the top scientists in the world in nanoscience, nanotechnology, according to you, what is the next breakthrough, next disruptive invention or next disruptive innovation in nanotechnology and nanoscience that according to you, it will totally change the face of the world within the next couple of decades? Yes, thank you. Sir. So I believe um, one innovation based on nanotechnology that would have massive impact is neural interfaces because our human body is made of more than 520 billion neurons and they form several trillion junctions. And there are lots of chemicals act on them, but fundamentally that interplay or the equilibrium is basically the human being. If you find a way to intercept these very fine neurons and decode their communication processes, we are potentially looking at a fantastic innovations that would help in uh, dealing with a number of diseases. Right now there is no cure. There are several diseases have no cure. We will definitely will have a potential for developing those uh, health innovations. But building on that, once we know how these processes are working, artificial intelligence for example, would be much more advanced compared to the current AI that is uh, now part of uh, a lot of IT information technology. So I think that would really change. And there is a startup company in US, I think a big company has invested in a startup company, $1 billion in a startup company, which is focusing on this interface. So I believe in the future, nanotechnology which deals with uh, something uh, thousand times smaller than a micron, uh, at that level, which you cannot see it, but we can actually make uh, devices and uh, materials and systems and we can train them. And <clears throat> I think these are the innovations uh, which would shape the future. And, and just to jump in what you just said, it's important to mention that uh, actually, uh, to make it short, should we be scared of it? Should we be scared of the possibility that we don't know, we cannot see, we cannot feel it? So what does it mean for keeping the human side of science, even though non-scientific people won't be able to understand what's going on? Yeah, so <clears throat> there is always, uh, it's a double-edged sword. 
where such advances if it is not properly uh, put forward for the benefit and welfare and progress of humanity, it could be sometimes uh, very challenging. So, this is where the non-scientists have to play a deeper role as well as scientists also have to maintain a communication with the others where their views, their way of thinking has a, a lot of tremendous value and uh, I really hope that communication remains very strong. Uh, it does not become a real divide where they are both two islands, they don't, there is no communication and then that is going to be a big disaster for the humanity. Whereas, if the communication is there, I believe the huma humans are extremely uh, flexible at the same time adaptive. They would be able to come up together a better way of handling advances because advances definitely needed. As far as I understood, 300,000 years human beings are there on the planet earth. If you look at what really made us so progressive, 300,000 years or 5,000 years, whichever number you pick because we have accumulation of knowledge. And the accumulation of knowledge is what made a progress in place and that requires participation of all human beings. The accumulation of knowledge is not only coming from scientists, I actually think even a philosophers would provide that, that particular a, a new knowledge from their thinking. So, I think it is a combination of both. It is not the science led knowledge, it is overall human knowledge. We need to advance it. We have another question. As you mentioned, new technologies will help people to cure disease and live longer. But this will raise other problems like overpopulation and aging population. How can we mean manage it? Right, you are absolutely right. So, with the advanced technologies, uh, the lifespan definitely would increase. For example, Singapore is the highest, uh, world's highest lifespan. It is there in the uh, reports. Uh, in Singapore, average lifespan is given about 80 years. And one problem with that is the number of unhealthy years is about 10 years. And this is the time uh, there is a lot of um, uh, medical support is needed. And so, healthcare advances would help in alleviating these burdens on the in individuals. But your question is from the point of uh, uh, scale of uh, things in a as a system of systems that means as a country, as a community as a world, uh, do we need to now provide for uh, a more number of people and uh, would that pose a different challenge? I think answer is while that happens, if the humans are applying their innovative mind and as well as imaginative mind, they can address these issues. While right now it may appear a daunting task, but um, it is very surprising for me is uh, human ability is quite good. So, they actually can come up with an alternative. I give an example. Right now, the worldwide the massive concern is microplastics. So, if you look around, there is plenty of plastics. Eventually, uh, they become microplastics, they end up in waterways, they get back and affect the human health. But there is already thinking and innovations are coming. Uh, new kinds of plastics, they are completely uh, degradable, acceptable by the environment as a limited negative effect. So, that is because the humans are able to solve the problem. So, I put my faith that if we can give them the uh, encouragement and the motivation, uh, they would be able to get around it. Of course, uh, concern should be there because of the concern, the concerns will make us to focus. And I think uh, whoever has asked that question about does this pose a problem? Answer is yes. But since we recognize there is a problem, I am very sure we can innovate. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe the last question um, is this one with integration of nanotechnology in human body, there is a probability of superiority that could lead to a more divided world and equality. Do you think that is more of bane than boon for us? Yeah, thank you for that question. Yes, uh, the, these advanced technologies are tend to be expensive. 
And uh, your concern about haves and have nots is serious, uh, is a serious question. And if you look around what's going on around the world, um, either with or without technology, even a digital technologies, you already see a digital divide. Not only digital technologies, many other forms, the access is always not equitable. So, the, one of the biggest challenge for humanity is uh, equitable development and where the access is provided for. And I think that is a challenge. This is where the role of, um, I believe, governments, uh, policy makers, <coughs> business leaders, uh, they will really have to work to, uh, together in terms of uh, nudging the human society in that direction. It's possible. It's just a question of all these different actors, uh, they needed to think differently. And if they think differently, I'm very sure uh, such a divide would not be, um, I do not think it will be totally eliminated, but I think that can be managed. Uh, if we think it is going to be uh, totally eliminated, a utopian society, I have a doubt that would probably be difficult because humans are not perfect, but it does not mean they're totally imperfect. So, we are dealing with the imperfect humans, but if they put their heads together, it's highly likely uh, they would mitigate that, so that still that this journey will continue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Siram. Thank you. Thank you.